on, let's give them some love, y'all. Y'all, y'all do know that prayer changes things. Amen. 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 So we've been in this series five weeks, couple, couple, three more weeks left um, in this miracle of mercy. And today I want to talk about how much you matter to God. And why is this an important topic? How much you matter to God? Because it, it is my belief or my observation or my belief from my observations um, that society will throw you away in, in a heartbeat. If you, if you depend upon the depictions of whoever is presenting um, the story, the other side seems to be devalued. If you are a Democrat and you are in the presence of a group of Republicans, then you are denigrated. If you are a Republican and you're in the presence of Democrats, then you are denigrated. If you are rich um, and you're around some folks who are envious, uh, they will make you feel less valuable. And sometimes when folks on the other side of the fence um, get together, they make policies that seem like they don't care and value about people who are poor. It, if you are a uh, Clippers fan and, and, and you get together, you talk bad about being a Lakers fan. And if you are a Lakers fan, you get together and you talk about the Clippers ain't won nothing, so they ain't got nothing to be excited about about. Come on somebody, if, if you are a Methodist, you talk about the Baptists, and the Baptists talk about the Methodists, and then the Methodists and the Baptists get together and talk about the Muslims, and we all got some way to talk about someone to try to devalue them. Amen. Amen. And I need you to understand, but that is simply a trick of the enemy, because God did not come here to save those who are black or white or those who are Democrats or Republican, those who are rich or poor, those who like Clippers and those who are misguided and like the Clippers and those who <laughs> love the Lakers. Amen. God sent his son to save the whole world. Amen. And in God's eyes, there are two kinds of people. There are those who are saved and those who are lost. And God has a desire to save all who are lost. Titus tells us that Jesus saves us, saved us, not because of the good things we did, but because of his incredible, I inserted incredible mercy. He's washed away our sins and gave us new life through the Holy Spirit. I need you to understand something. That in order for us to truly get closer to God and understand who God is, we need to understand his mercy. And it is this mercy that moved his heart for us to have a way to salvation. Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. Now, let me, let me just kind of tell you for a moment, um, don't, don't, get, don't trip if you are one who's on the lost side, because I would argue that, that, that if you are lost, um, that is a wonderful thing today. Because I'm going to tell you something about God and the lost that should encourage you. Amen? Amen? Amen. So in our pericope, in our pericope, we see in our passage, there's three stories of lostness. And I'll kind of really go through each one really quick and explain it. Um, the, the, there, was the, there were the Pharisees and the scribes who were observing, watching, scoping out Jesus. And they noticed that he did something that they thought was absolutely inappropriate and strange. What he did was he hung out and he not only hung out with these sinners, um, um, but he also ate with them. What that means, if you eat with someone, that means you embrace them and you accept them. Sometimes you can't help who you hang out with, but some, you, can also, you can always control who you eat with. And they used that as a way to disqualify because in their minds, those people were outsiders and they were uh, sinners and they were lost. And so there were three kind of loss that, um, that Jesus wanted to respond. The first he talked about a lost sheep. Here's what I want you to understand, a lost sheep. So, so there, was, there was a shepherd who was caring for 100 sheep, 
And his job was to make sure they get from point A to point B safely. Watch this. And when he got there, and at night they would always go to a safe place, and, and they would make sure that they were safe. And he would always, the shepherd would always count the sheep. So this particular night he goes, you know, 98, 99. Uh-oh. There's one missing. And what, what he did was the shepherd, he made sure those 99 were safe. He made sure that they were secure. He made sure they were well fed and that they were going to be okay. And he went out to find that which was lost. The second story he tells in this parable, he tells a story of a lost coin. He tells of a woman who had 10 coins. And one day she discovered one of the coins was missing. And it said that she tore up the house looking under uh, the couch pillows, amen, pulling back things and to find it. And when she found it, she was so happy and she told everybody she found it. Are you all with me? So there was a lost sheep. Then there was a lost coin. And then we have this final story where we know as the prodigal son was a lost son. A guy who lived in luxury of his rich father. He had an older brother and, and, um, and he goes to his father. He says to his father, he says, Dad, you know what? He couldn't have been, that, that wouldn't have been my dad. I'm just letting you know. I'm just going to tell you, the, before I even tell you the rest of the story, I'm going to say that was not my dad in this story. Well, walked up to him and said, Dad, I want all my inheritance. Well, first of all, you can never walk up to my dad and ask for nothing. Come on, somebody. Secondly, to ask for it at the time he asked for it, it meant in my mind that he was dead. So, so the father only passed on the inheritance when he was dead or on his deathbed. And yet his father seemed to be healthy. We see in the, in the text he was a healthy father and he asked for his inheritance. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, give me my money when it wasn't yours in the first place. And I, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. Not only that, he took all this money and the father was wealthy. He had a lot of money. And he went out and he got some friends and they had a good time. They were doing what y'all know what they were doing. Yeah. Amen. And, and, they say, and he said that when he ran out all of his money, he found himself all alone with no money in a pig pen. Lost. One loss because of wondering. One loss because of neglect. One loss because of rebellion. And here's what I want you to understand. Write this down. The first thing I want you to write down. This is very, very important. Lostness implies value. <laughs> Let me see if I can make sense of it. <clears throat> Have you ever lost something or misplaced something that you just kind of blew off and said, I'll get another one? Whatever it would be. You know, like maybe it's one of those cheap pins. You know, you can buy you know, those little cheap Big pins, you know, you can get, you know, 10 for a dollar or something like that. Right. And if you lost it or misplaced it, you're like, oh, I'll find another one because easy come, what? Easy go. But if you lost something and you're searching for it, if you go out into the wilderness for it, if you go and pull up the couch and look on the floor for it, if you, if you go to the pig pen to find it, that means it's valuable. Come on, somebody. You only search for something that is valuable to you. And I want you to understand that if someone said that you're lost, if you're lost, that doesn't mean you're not valuable. It means that God loves you so much that he's willing to search for you. Come on, somebody. Amen. So it implies value. And I need you to understand, as you go out there into the world, you see folks that are lost. You see folks that are unsaved. Don't be so harsh on them. Treat them like they're valuable. Treat them like God loves them. Boy, y'all a tough crowd today. Amen. And so I want to just kind of answer um, three questions as we move in this text. The first question I want to answer is, what do, um, what do I lose when I am spiritually lost? What do I lose when I am spiritually lost? Like the lost sheep, the one who became lost because of what your sheep they get lost not because they're rebellious, because they're so into just kind of doing their thing. You know, all the other sheep go this way and just not paying attention. It just kind of wanders off and gets lost and just kind of looks up and like, whoa, how did I get here? It's kind of like, you know, some of y'all do, even with GPS. How many of y'all kind of just 
Got your GPS on, the GPS is talking to you, and you're not really paying attention. You done passed your exit two exits ago, and then, you know, you got the sister girl on the GPS getting mad, getting attitude with you. Anybody got a GPS to get attitude? I'm going to tell you, one time my GPS smacked it, like, I told you to exit. I'm like, whoa, that sounds like my wife. Anyway, uh, never mind. So, so, so sometimes we just kind of go astray if you look at that, that one thing that we lose and when that sheep discovered it was lost and it didn't follow the direction, it realizes that when we are lost, I lose, write this down, my direction. Look at the text. Isaiah 53 and 6 simply says, all of us have strayed away just like a lost sheep. We've all left God's path to follow our own way. Watch this. I need you to understand something about sin most of us don't just go, sin. No, we kind of just drift into it. <laughs> kind of ease into it. And before you know it, you knee deep in something. There's a, there's a friend of mine who pastors a very large church in, on the East Coast, and his most uh, trusted um, uh, administrative assistant was going through some financial problems and didn't tell anyone. And so... The, 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 at that time, the tape and CD ministry would always come through the administrative assistant. So she would have all the tapes and the CDs or whatever it may be, and they would pay the $10 and she would give. And, 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 and she just decided, well, I just need a little bit. So she took $10 here, $5 here, and before you know it, she had taken more than $8,000 over the course of three years. She didn't steal eight thousand. She stole five dollars, ten dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. You just kind of drift into it, and before she realized it, she was eight thousand dollars in debt, intended to pay it back. How many of you all have gotten into trouble just one step at a time? You didn't mean to go there with him. It started off with just a text message. Then a late night coffee. Well, I'll just come up for a little while. Oh, now I'm on your street, huh? We just kind of wonder. Most of us don't dive into sin. We just kind of find ourselves in it. And then you say, how did I get here? Amen. We lose our direction when we are spiritually lost. The second thing we lose, we lose our protection. My people are wandering like lost sheep without a shepherd to protect them and to guide them. Zechariah says that, that we wander without protection. And what I need you to understand are sheep. The problem with that lost sheep is not only that he's lost, but he is not protected. He doesn't have the protection of the shepherd. The psalm tells us that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. The shepherd is with me in the valley of the shadow of death because he has a rod and a staff. He's out there all by himself with no shepherd, with no rod, no staff, no protection. And what you all need to understand is that there's always wolves lingering in the background. The sheep never see them, but the shepherd know they're there. And when you wander off all by yourself, you become vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. We lose our direction and we lose our protection. But the other thing is that we learn uh, from the lost coin is that we also lose our potential. Mm. No one has ever seen or heard or even imagined the wonderful things God has prepared and arranged for those who love him. I need you to understand is that, that God has a plan for us. But when we are lost without protection and direction, we also lose our potential. You, need to, you didn't get it. That, that, that when the coin was lost, it was still worth what it was worth. But no one had it, so it could not do any good. 
So, 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 so this is a dollar. A dollar. Anybody want a dollar? You want a dollar? Come here. Come here. Yes, sir. Young man. Yes, come. You want this dollar? Come here. Come on. Come, come, come right here. What's up, Marcus? How you doing? You want this dollar? Why? You can save it because it's a dollar, right? Now, what if this dollar was lost, right? And someone has stepped on it, and no one had found it for a long time. And now I just found this dollar that's been stepped on. It's wrinkled. It got a little rip in it. You still want it? You don't want it now? No, I'm saying, but you, would you still want a dollar even if it's wrinkled? and No. no? You do, it has germs. You know you messed it up my illustration, right? Huh? Man, get out of here. Yeah, here you go. He ain't going to outsmart me, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he said, I don't want it, but he still took it. Why? Because once it was discovered, its potential had not changed, even though it had been lost. But when we're lost... We lose our potential. And maybe you can't do much with a dollar, but imagine a bunch of dollars coming together and the potential them working together could have. Imagine a bunch of lost folks being discovered and coming together and the potential that they have. When we are lost, we lose our potential. When we're lost spiritually, we lose our direction. When we're lost spiritually, we lose our protection. When we're lost spiritually, we lose our, our potential. And then look at this. So the coin teaches us about potential. The sheep teaches us about direction and protection. But the sun teaches us about we lose our happiness. Our happiness. Look at this. The younger son wasted all he'd been given. And eventually he became miserable, underline miserable, and lonely. Hmm. It's amazing how some of us think that money will bring happiness. Seriously, I have had the pleasure, the privilege, and the pain of pastoring and counseling and talking with people who make un just amazing amounts of money. And it's amazing that how they juxtaposed their lives when they were broke versus how they juxtaposed their lives with this money. And they talk about when you start making this money, your life becomes chasing the dollar and chasing things. And you spend money you don't have to impress folks you don't like with things you don't need. And it's amazing how you see star after star, athlete after athlete, who has seemed like they have everything, but yet they're miserable. Chasing the almighty dollar. And I just, can I just pause for a minute? Y'all may think I'm being silly, but, but Sam knows. I, I don't know any of you guys. I grew up in an era where there were government programs. And they used to give this, this, these big blocks of government cheese. Anybody remember government? Who remember government cheese? Go, government. Not government, but government. It was government cheese. You, you remember government cheese? You remember government? Now watch this. I'm, I'm going to give you a Then it was not only gov government cheese, but they also had the government what? Bologna, big thing, and what else? A big tub of butter, the butter, yes. And then there was the man, uh, not the man, it was the, the um, peanut butter. You remember the peanut butter? Now watch this. In the peanut butter, you open that big old silver can, big old thing, and when you open it, what was on the top? Oil, big old uh, inch and a half of oil. And if you ever tried to put that peanut butter on anything, First of all, you could not stir it unless you had three people and a steel spoon. You couldn't stir it with plastic. You couldn't stir it with wood. It would break anything you stick in there. Amen. Am I, I mean, I'm not telling the truth. That not only that, you try to spread that on some bread, it would tear that bread up. And then that, and then, and then that, 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 dog, that doggone cheese, you, it would not melt. The cheese didn't melt. I'm trying to tell you. My brother, my brother, right? Am I telling the truth? You put that thing in the microwave, it, it just turns to grease. <laughs> How many know I'm telling the truth? Amen. 
There was lava from a volcano couldn't melt that cheese. But yet we were government peanut butter, um, uh, bologna, butter and and powdered milk great raised people. And we were broke, busted and disgusted. And I didn't even know I was poor. I was happy. And now we chase after all this fame. We chase after fortune. And it seems like happiness flees us. And it says that we 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 wonder our, we wonder um, from God. Our circumstances separate us from God. Our wondering separates us from God, and our choices separate us from God. But the last thing, this last spiritual consequence of us when we're lost, not only do we lose our direction, our protection, our potential, our happiness, but we also lose our home in heaven. That why go through all this pain in life, all this struggle in life, if, if, if eternity you're going to be lost? What good is it for a man or woman to gain the entire world if he or she loses his soul? The lost son not only lost his wealth, but he lost his home. He found himself as a Jew. In a pig pen. Hmm. But I need to tell you all something. This is very important. Courtney, hear me on this. This is very, very important. Even though you may have lost direction and protection and potential and happiness, and even your place in heaven, your home in heaven, you still do not lose your value. Write it down. But I do not lose my value. For God still so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish or not be lost, but they shall have eternal life. I need you all to hear me on this. I'm almost halfway not finished, but I need you all to hear me and hear me well. That even though we have fallen to sin because we've wandered, even though we have fallen to sin because maybe we've been neglected, even if we have looked God in God's face and turned our back and gone our own ways, that does not devalue us in the eyes of God. You are still valuable. As a matter of fact, did you know art, valuable art, expensive art, if it's lost, its value goes up and down? God so valued you that he gave his only son for you. And when you're talking to those who are lost, don't tell them how wretched and how, how they're going to hell. Tell them how valuable they are and how much God loves them and that God wants to direct them and that God wants to protect them and God wants their potential to live in them. And God didn't want them to be happy, but he wants them to have joy and that God wants to be in eternity with them in heaven. Don't tell them about hell. Tell them about heaven. And tell them about their value. On the last side of that little tiny sheet that nobody can read because it's so small. The second question is, how does God's mercy save me? You said that this is all about God's mercy. How does it save me? Well, first thing I want you to see is that salvation rescues me from myself. <laughs> Woo! It rescues me. Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God. It's Jesus, not ourselves. He became a human and gave himself to rescue us from us. <laughs> Listen, to rescue us from us. We can't save ourselves. When the sheep was lost, it could not recover itself. When the coin was lost, the coin could not find itself. Come on, somebody. And when the son decided to go home, he couldn't accept himself. Y'all with me on that? And so it's interesting because some of us say, I don't need saving from me. Yes, you do. You need saving from yourself. I got a friend of mine. He's been married um, about four or five times, and um, he's been in about three serious relationships then, since then. And he said, it's about nine of them. He goes, he goes you know, man, sh these women are a trip today, boy. They all messed up. And I said, well, I didn't meet them all. I met some of them. But there is a common denominator <laughs> with all nine of them. You. Sometimes we need help 
To be saved from our what? Trust me in your time of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. God says, I will rescue you from your mess, and you will give me glory because your testimony comes from your mess. Amen. Rescue us from ourselves. Why? Because if we are caught in ourselves, we are bitter and not better. Amen? Our circumstances make us bitter. Because you remember, if, if God can change our troubles into glory, that means he turns our bitterness into betterness. You didn't get it. And I need you to understand, sometimes it's just one move of God, one little thing can change, because the difference between bitter and better is one letter. Sometimes we're just one movement away from betterness. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we're just one act of God away from being better. And God can save us from ourselves, too. We not only rescue, he rescues me from myself, but watch this. I recover my potential. Hmm. Woo, that's good stuff. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and worn out from carrying too much. Uh, Learn to trust and rest in me, and I will recover your life. Amen. What have you lost that needs to be recovered? Come on, somebody. Have you lost your joy? Have you lost your strength? Have you lost your confidence? Have you lost your ability to dream and to hope and have desires? I will give you back what you lost, says the Lord. In the years when the locusts ate all your crops, Joel tells us that the locusts, the grasshoppers, can destroy a big crop in a matter of hours. All that you have built can be destroyed in a moment. But God says, I can restore all that. The, 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 the field that has no growth, I can give it back to you. Amen. Amen. He says, in me, you can do all things. Without me, you can do no thing. Amen. Not only can we, we rescue us from ourselves, not only does mercy recover my potential, but also mercy reconnects me to God. It reconnects me to God. Anyone who connects to Christ becomes a what? A new person. The past is what? Forgotten and everything becomes brand new. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. Our sins separate us from God. And, God, and Jesus Christ, watch this. Someone said, here's how you do evangelism. Here's God. Here's man. And we're connected. But our sin turns us away from God. But Jesus on the cross bridges the gap again. And that we are reconciled because of Christ Jesus, not because of our own selves. Amen? Boy, y'all rough proud on me today. That's all right. I still love you. But now here's the last question, and I'll close on this. How do I connect with God's mercy? Pitch, you talking about God's mercy is so wonderful and that it gives us direction and protection and potential and happiness and a, a place in heaven and um, it rescues me and it recovers me and it reconnects me. But how do I connect with it? How do I get that connection with God? And I want you to understand with God's mercy, he says, I want you to understand the first thing we must do, we must be fed up with our current sinful situation. He was, look at the text, it says he was wasted uh, he wasted all, he had wasted it all. Um, he had nothing left. He got desperate. He got hungry. Then he finally came to his senses. Listen, listen, listen. We must get tired. We must become sick and tired of being what? Sick and tired. We got to, how many of y'all, I, I had a lady come to me one time and she says, you know, I'm just tired of being tired. She says, I want to change my life. And you know, you can't save nobody. Sometimes, bless you, sometimes you have to, people have to hit rock bottom before they're ready to change. And it's hard for us to allow people to hit rock bottom because we love them and we care for them. But sometimes you've got to get to a point where you're just tired of being all messed up. Amen. I, I met a couple. They had been married for 50 years. And um, and um. And I said, man, you guys have a great relationship. I said, man, how do, you, how do you do it? He said, it wasn't always great. He said, man, our first 17 years was 
horrible. I said, how He said, every day I debated whether I was going to come back home. He said, every day. I said, so what'd you do? He said, I just got tired of fighting. He said, when I stopped fighting, he said, she stopped fighting. And she said, whoo, I'm so glad we don't fight no more. <laughs> she was ready to stop fighting, but she said, if he going to fight, I'm going to fight. Come on, somebody. I just saved somebody's marriage just now. Someone said, so just say thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Boy, Tim was over there like, hey, man. Shoot. Why, you should have said that three years ago. Why? You got to get fed up with your life. Fed up with your sin. Fed up with that. But the second thing I want you to look at is that not only that, it says you have to own your own sin. Own your own sin. Watch this. He came to his senses. He said, I have sinned against God and sinned against you. We have to own our sin. Let me tell you something. You all should never put nobody on a pedestal, especially me. I tell y'all I got issues because I know I got issues. Everybody got issues. But, you, if, but if you can't own your own mess, then you'll never receive the fullness of God's mercy. Come on, somebody. You ever heard that saying? Someone says, if I tell my story, it's a testimony. If you tell my story, it's a scandal. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And if you tell your, your story and you tell the truth, you're open to God's mercy. I had somebody, Robert, you won't believe this. I had somebody um, read me one time. Uh, uh, he wanted to read me, you know. Um, uh, he wanted a position um, in the doggone choir, too. And I was like, man, you're not ready for it. And I, I said, you're not ready for this. I said, because of this, this, that, and the other. I said, those are areas are growing. I said, I'm going to help you. You know, you, know, you know, I love you enough to sit with you and work through these things. And he turns around and goes, oh, but what about you? I said, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to sing in the choir, right? He said, no, no, you got you this. And you this, and you this, and you this. And people know you this way. And you know, and I tell everybody, I said, I said, you're right, I'm all those things. I said, but you miss one. And I gave him the fifth one. I said, I'm that too. And he says, yeah, you all that. And he says, so what makes us different? I said, the difference between you and I is this. I saw your faults so that I could figure out how to love you and help you. You saw my faults and you wanted to figure out how to destroy me. I said, my faults are not exposed for you to destroy me. My faults are exposed so that you can love me in spite of my faults. I assessed you so I can love you. You judge me so you can condemn me. And all of us have faults so all of us could be condemned. But God's mercy says, if you, if you confess your... Come on, somebody. He is faithful and just. Not to make you perfect, but to purge you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How many of y'all glad? I, I think I just, I thought I just helped somebody today. You ain't got to walk around like you're perfect. You can walk around with your chest out with all your imperfections because you're going to allow someone to love you in spite of your mess. Mm. Amen. That should have helped somebody today. Let me close on this because y'all, y'all, y'all rough on the brother. I need to be fed up with my life. I, I need to own my sin. But the last one, before I tell you, look at the text. Look at the difference. There's a shift. In verse 12, the son says, give me my share. In verse 19, he says, make me a servant. You didn't get it. You would have got it. The last thing I need you to understand is that I must offer up myself. In other words, I must give my life away. In verse 12, he was selfish and wanted to get. In verse 19, he had a desire to give. He was willing to give himself away. He recognized that he had messed up. Now, this is the last part. I'm leaving. I'm not even, I can't even shake your hand after this because this is going to bless me. I'm going to get blessed one more time. Look at this. When he changed his mindset of being of service, Versus of being a burden. Look at what it says here. The father responded in this way. While he was still a long way off. His father saw him. And was filled with what? 
compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Stop. Stop. I need someone to help me on that. Help me real quick. Where was the son before his father saw him? He was a ways off. But well, what, what, what was he doing before he, when he, when he came to himself, where was he? Hanging out in the pigs with the pigs. A Jewish culture brother hanging out with the pigs. A stinky, dirty, un, un, um, a defiled animal, right? He goes from there. And then after he meets his father, his father tells his servants to do what to him? Put on a robe and clean him up. All right, you're going to get it. Let me see. Over here, he's in a pig pen. Over here, he's in a new robe. In the middle, he meets his father who embraces him and kisses him. You still didn't get it. He kissed him and embraced him while he was still in all of his pigness. He didn't clean him up first. He loved him first. And then he cleaned him up. And what I'm trying to tell you is that some of you all think you got to get cleaned up to come up into God's house. No, God wants you in all your pigness. He wants you in all your stinkingness. He wants to love you where you are so you know that he loves you just as you are. And I need you to understand that when you have been forgiven and you have been received, sometimes it happens on the inside first before you see it on the outside. He had a change in his heart and in his mind before you saw it externally. In other words, sometimes it takes a moment for you to come out your mess and others recognize it. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. I'm going to sit down because you didn't get it. Did you get it? Say amen. Well, let me give you one more because you didn't get it. Let me tell you why I know you didn't get it. There's another brother by the name of Lazarus. One of Jesus' homeboys, right? Jesus' homeboy Lazarus died. And Mary and Martha got a little attitude with Jesus when he finally came. Mm. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he said, man, you tripping. He says, Lazarus, get up. Lazarus gets up, but it took Lazarus a minute to come out. And then he said, he gives a command and says, Aunt Lucy. Right? When he loosed him, he came out. Boy, I wish somebody would get this thing. Y'all making me work hard. He's dead and he's wrapped in his dead clothes. His dead garment. When Jesus spoke, he was fully healed. But he was still wrapped up in the death. And so... Y'all wanted him to come run on his